Hello and welcome to today's IALD webinar. At time of crisis, what are lighting designers thinking in the age of COVID-19? My name is Joe de Guzman, Senior Certification Coordinator for the IALD. Well, great, thank you, Joe. And uh, greetings, webinites. And I promise, uh, unless you see a blue ribbon, uh, this is the last you will hear from me for a while. Uh, in fact, last week's webinar uh, that I was privileged to host with the inimitable Don Hollingsworth, and this week's webinar with the equally stellar Jim, Jill, and Keith uh, are related. But more on that in my panel introductions in a moment. Today is meant to be a conversation, first with my esteemed panel, and then with all of you. Hopefully you, will have, hopefully you have a questions window on your screen, uh, and it is here that you can posit any thoughts or queries that you want to present to the panel. Uh, we ask that if you if you uh, can address your questions to a specific person, it'll help us move the move the process along a little bit faster. Today's discussion stems from my own exploration on how we as an industry are dealing with and responding to the extraordinary events affecting all of us across the planet. I personally sought advice and perspective as it, as it related to the current corona pandemic. And knowing that lighting designers are some of the most thoughtful and generous people on the planet, I reached out to a few of my colleagues and friends and asked that they share their insights with me on the impact COVID-19 was having on their studios. Not only was I grateful for the meaningful and honest responses I received, I'm delighted that they were all willing to share their thoughts with the greater lighting design community. From Asia to North America to Europe, I invited Andrew, Anne, Jim, Juliet, Jill, two Keiths, Mickey and Patty to respond to a few prompts that I put forward. What I got back was an astonishing treasure trove of thoughtful, meaningful and useful information. I also learned that wherever we live on this blue marble, we all share similar joys, concerns, and fears. When I shared my newfound knowledge with IALD staff, they asked me to put an even more human touch on this topic. So today's webinar is the result of that discussion. So without further ado, here is our panel. Interestingly, all of our thought leaders have multiple studios in the United States. I hope this scenario will feed the conversation. Jim Bainey is a partner at Schiller Shook, headquartered in Chicago. He has many years of experience lighting the built environment. He believes crafting sustainable lighting solutions that meet client requirements and integrate tightly with the architectural design is critical to each project. Jim enjoys teaching others about lighting design, which is why he's here today and looks forward to leading an in-person, he looks forward to leading in-person presentations again as soon as possible. Jill Clores is a partner of Essential Light Design Studio headquartered in Dallas. Her designs include healthcare and senior living, museum and entertainment venues, and civic, corporate, and educational projects. She's a graduate of the University of Colorado, and she began her career as a manufacturer's applications manager electric utility consultant, and is now a well-renowned lighting designer. Back in the 20th century, Keith started his career under the master Bill Lamb in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Leaving the practice to practice, leaving the design field, the lighting design field to practice architecture and engineering for a few years, he returned to Lamb Partners just in time to welcome the 21st century. Through many years of professional practice, he remains dedicated to teaching and sharing his enthusiasm for lighting and architecture at many colleges and universities throughout the United States. Lighting designers love to talk about lighting design. So with that, uh, I thought I would start with some of the questions that I posited in the original uh, article or, or uh, interview uh, that I shared with all nine designers. And I'm going to start with Jim. If you would start with the first question, and then Jill and Keith, we can add you in, or you can jump in and add comments, or however, however this kind of takes its course, we'll see what happens. So question number one, what direct impact has the pandemic, remote working, isolation, and the news had on your business 
and your life. Jim? Stephen, yeah, first of all, Stephen, thanks for, for getting us all together. I know we're, we're much better together than we, than we are apart. So I'm, I'm really grateful for this, um, uh, the gathering of industry leaders and everybody uh, on the line here to talk about this. So we're looking forward to it. I'm gonna take this in a personal direction because I know we're gonna talk about a lot of uh, more business related items, but for me, I, I love to be around people. I love to be around my team. I do much better walking over to somebody's desk and talking through a design issue than I do sending a, a chat room text or, or an email. So for me, the biggest challenge I think right now is, um, is you know, Teams is great, WebEx is great, Zoom is great when you're not being Zoom bombed, but uh, uh, I, I love to get together with people. So I'm looking forward to getting back to some uh, in-person collaboration around a table or a desk. And I think uh, in terms of my, my work from home situation, one of the things that I didn't expect, but I'm realizing is true, I used to have a commute every day that um, some, some days I would loathe, but it, it was just part of my life. And I've learned that that actually had a beneficial result in my life is that it gave me a bit of a buffer between thinking about the myriad concerns at work uh, and all the issues, uh, and then being able to be fully present with my family when I got home. And I realized that uh, the, the 14 stairs between where I am now and my, in my uh, basement office and the dining room is a lot shorter than that 45 minutes used to be. So uh, honestly, I'm struggling with it, struggling to be fully present here at work uh, with, with especially all the extra items that have been added in with a crisis and then getting upstairs and being fully present with my family as well. So that's kind of a, a personal note of some of the things that I'm struggling with. Jill or Keith, do you want to, you, uh, Jill, do you have anything you want to add to that? Sure. You asked about, you know, what direct impact has this had on the business and, and personally, um, business wise, it's been, uh, in amazing, incredible, I guess just unexpected that we've had business pick up considerably since the beginning of March. So projects that wow. were, were going are continuing to move ahead. New projects have come online with extremely crunched deadlines. Um, and even some of them that were moving along previously have, have had um, accelerated deadlines and more requests for proposals than I've seen in quite a while. So um, it feels a little frothy to be um, using a 2008 word. And my concern is that this will all, the froth will blow over and, you know, this will come to a crashing halt. So we're definitely, you know, trying to make hay while the sun shines and take on work. We've, one of the, the interesting things is, um, you know, we've been busy. We, we brought on a new lighting designer April 1st. And so onboarding someone in this time of, of quarantine has been definitely interesting, introducing her to the team um, and getting things flowing the way, you know, we'd like them to. And then we do have a, a previous employee who left to get her master's who's going to be joining us in May. Um, so we'll be increasing, which is good because we've got the work right now. But my huge concern is how long will this last? So my, my fear is that is the crashing halt that we may um, experience. And, and on the personal side, so my wife is a personal trainer. So all of her work has come to a complete halt. There's no gym. There's no house visits or any of that. So she complains that all she sees is the back of my head. Um, and I'm a little bit envious of some of the folks that seem to have a whole bunch of extra time um, and, and maybe, you know, some of the silver linings that a lot of us are finding during this time of, of quarantine with family and, and time, um, you know, we'll potentially get to experience upcoming and that could be a silver lining, but that's how things look from my perspective at the moment. Yeah, yeah. who has time to attend all these webinars anyway? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, good afternoon, Stephen, my esteemed colleagues. Um, it's a beautiful day here in Plymouth, Massachusetts. It's uh, above freezing, which is a small victory for um, a New England April. Um, and I, uh, I have to tell you, I've started to grow my own uh, PPE. I, I figured, you know, um, I'd certainly forget this thing when I'm running out. So why not just make it a part of me? But you know, the craziest thing, the thing that doesn't make sense to me, Stephen, right now in this whole pandemic is um, why are the golf courses closed? There's no snow on the ground. Yeah, right. Again, for New England, that means it's golf season, right? There you go. <laughs> I'm with you, Keith. He's ready. I'm waiting. He's ready. <laughs> I, totally. It's kind of, it's crazy. I mean, you know, it's the perfect sport, right? You're outside, getting fresh air, getting your melanopic lux, 
And and the way I play, I'm never around people anyway. They're yeah, four hours the in isolation. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great. It's great. So we're waiting for the waiting for the golf courses to open up here. But it's been uh, it's been an interesting ride. You know, that's that those those are my issues from from that side. But you know, on the business side, it's it's probably I don't think uh, it's impacted us any differently than than most of our colleagues, right? Working remotely, getting used to the new normal. Um, we're all very busy, like Jill. Um, it's we had a lot of work in the pipeline. Uh, very few, if any, any projects were canceled. Maybe one or so. Uh, several went on hold or a delayed start. But but we continue to receive RFPs, and um, however, not as many as we did, you know, before this whole thing started. So so what that's telling me is that we will probably have some slower times ahead. Well, thanks for that. That was that's a great kickoff to this conversation, everybody. So let's move on. Let's move on to our second question. Uh, what have been your biggest concerns and takeaways, both internally to your studio and externally to your clients in the outside world? Jill, why don't you lead us off? Um, I suppose that you know the biggest concern is. As I mentioned earlier, we've seen you know a bump in the work, and we anticipate a lull in the work. And in in having you know folks, um, employees, people on staff that that want to get things done, how do how do we keep things manageable without it getting you know, crazy and you're pulling your hair out, and then there's not much to do? So th that's certainly a concern in terms of workflow. Um, I think not so much of a concern but it's been truly interesting to see how we can be separate and yet be collaborative and so you know we've got three or four people working on one project together to try and get you know cds done in a week um kind wow. of a crazy schedule but but in pulling people together and how, how that got done in a, a relatively short period of time for a, a group of um four uh individuals all with um challenges with their connections and wi-fi dropping and you know at the office we have fiber and everything's fabulous and you know where everybody's got their own wi-fi hiccups um so there's that and and then the other um but 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 that what that showed us is that some of the stuff that we could do in the office we can do at home and even some of the stuff we haven't even pushed ourselves to do in the office that we did do this way gives me um great confidence that you know when we come back together we potentially will be stronger for all of this, so that's that's been a um, a great experience, actually. Wow. Well, it's nice to know that you're busy, that the future is still looking bright, no pun intended. Uh, and uh, I hope that's true for uh, for all of us. We certainly still have work in our pipeline as well, and hoping that other shoe doesn't drop. Uh, what about what about you, uh, Keith? How how would you respond to this question? Well, you're right. That's that's kind of the I think the the most um, the biggest concern right now is uh, is the unknown, right? Um, since this hasn't peaked yet or is just now peaking, we don't know how much how, how long it will last, right? What the future holds for us, um, and basically how long can we hold our breath through this? Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned before, we kind of suspect our summer will be slower. But how slow is that? Uh, will it continue into the fall? Will it continue into next year? Uh, we don't know, obviously. We've never known, but now it seems a little bit harder to predict uh, given the uncertainty. So, you know, keeping mouths fed, keeping the tunable lights on <laughs> and the roofs over our heads are certainly our goals. But we do remain optimistic. There, you know, there, there are a lot of good positive things about coming through this. And we have to remain optimistic, right? It's our job to design the future. We right. have to believe that there is one. So I think that's our and, and picking up on on Keith's concept of designing for the future and what that future will look like. And I, I we do a lot of tenant improvement type jobs, and I just wonder how much um, folks are going to feel like they don't want to work in in areas that are these collaborative areas where a whole bunch of people are um, together for periods of time. Are we going to see? the whole design of, of office space or any kind of space where people were working together change. Lots and I think doors. we will. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, lots, lots of uh, ways to, to um, seclude yourself, to create privacy. So I, I just, I think the design community as a whole, architects and interior designers will respond and we'll have to respond. But for the short term, 
what will happen? Will some of those projects go on hold or just not build some new office space because they don't know how to build and design new office space yet? What are people going to want to do? Are they going to want to work from home now? Has this been a good experience? And I mentioned in some respects it has been. So will there be more work from home and less office space? Yeah. Does that mean that there's more opportunities in residential design? I mean, I think that, that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, things that will the change was happening anyway in these directions, but this is going to accelerate that. And I think there might be a little bit of a freeze while people figure it out. Good point. Yeah, good point. I think that's true. Yeah, I think that's true, Jill. I mean, another thing we've been thinking about is what's this going to look like as we start to get back, back to work, away from our homes. Um, how do we how do we keep our teams safe? How do we keep everybody safe that we're collaborating with? Folks on job sites. We've been putting together. Uh, some, some uh, basically a guidelines to keep our team safe when we go to job sites. And I, I've been talking to some folks who have been out in the field. And unfortunately, there are some job sites where they're not following the kind of recommendations that the CDC is putting forward. And even some of the guidelines, I think that the contractors are putting in place themselves, which means we're going to need to protect our team. We're going to need to protect uh, folks that, that work for our teams going out. And then once we get back to work, uh, how quickly will that happen and what will that look like when, when we go back to the office? Um, you know, we have a nice, we have the benefit of being fairly socially distanced <laughs> in our office right now as it is, which is, which is a nice thing, but um, we're, we're, we're struggling and, and sort of wrestling right now with some of those questions and we'll need to come up with answers to those. You know, it's funny what I, I I'm, I'm imagining this uh, cartoon that I, that, that came to mind while you were all talking, you get, there's a surfer, uh, in Hawaii and he's on a surfboard and the sun is shining and he's riding a great wave and he's having the greatest time uh, riding, riding on the ocean. And underneath him is this giant shark in gray with a tattoo on it that says anxiety. You know, so it's like we all, you know, we're all doing well, we're all planning for the future, but it is difficult. It is very difficult to escape that sense of underlying anxiety in everything we do. So I think you guys have articulated that. That's right. I, I think I heard Madeleine Albright say something like, uh, I'm optimistic, but I worry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> so on to our next question. Uh, what communication strategies have you deployed for staff, clients, uh, and vendors, and other people that you, that you communicate with as well? Uh, Keith, why don't you lead us off? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think... Um... I think it's been pretty similar probably to where everybody else is, is communicating these days, you know, tin cans and strings and fax machines. <laughs> <laughs> no, but most of the time, you know, we're we're on the phone anyway, web conferencing or emailing or so with our clients or reps, you know, when we're not in the in-person meetings, that part hasn't drastically changed that much, right? Uh, but now we have that with the staff, uh, the communication with the staff in the office. So, it's similar. We're using Zoom and GoTo and Google Hangouts and stuff. Slack is one that uh, we've had in our office for a while now, and it's a great platform. It's good because it's it's just internal, and uh, so the conversations don't have to fill up all of our inboxes. And you could set up groups for different projects or different interest groups and have Slack calls and review drawings and such. It's worked out. Uh, it's worked out pretty well for us. Uh, We've had the technology already set up for, for a while. So that, that is, that's all familiar. <clears throat> and on a weekly basis, we still have our, uh, our in-house, uh, you know, our, our, our office-wide meetings, uh, something we call Lumen Lunches on, on Monday at, at lunchtime and um, show kind of a show and tell and our weekly business meetings, we all get together on go to on that and recently we started uh, weekly happy hours so we don't have to worry about designated drivers um but unfortunately i think for me it, it kind of jim touched on this it's the lack of happenstance you know yeah. i tend um i tend to deliberately now converse with the folks that i'm working on a project with the casual exchanges of pleasantries or sharing of quick ideas in the kitchen all have to happen virtually, and and for me, it's it's not a serendipitous. It's it's quite a bit different. It's but hard. I think it is. It's hard, and and I think you know the interesting thing though is I think this current situation has has in some ways made our group even a little bit tighter. We're a pretty tight knit group anyway at at Lamb, but we're sharing experiences and feelings with each other the way we may not have been before had the time to. 
you know, heck, we're in, in everybody's houses now every day, right? I know what everybody's cat looks like. <laughs> so, you know, but it's, it, and even we were talking about this yesterday uh, for this ILD panel, right? We, we, we use our cameras, do we use our cameras or not, right? And unfortunately for the greater ILD audience, they have to look at my face, but it's great for me to see your faces, right? It's, it's kind of weird to be on all these Zoom calls and conference calls without uh, seeing people's faces. It's, it's like I'm in the spaceship far away and I imagine everybody else in their respective yeah. offices doing their work, living their normal lives, and I'm just kind of out there in the ozone somewhere. But when you get to see the participants, at least it makes, it makes it feel a little better. It's a little bit more personal. I think I think that's important in, in this, this isolated world right now. I think we're all I think I think we're all feeling that same sort of you know at, in a space station looking out at the world. It's, that's a really good point. So uh, uh, Jim, what do you what do you have uh, for us? Yeah, I mean, I, Keith, I, we I resonate with a lot of what you just said. Uh, we have multiple offices like you do. And we're availing ourselves of the technology as much as we can. Uh, we're, we, we use Teams, so we're all hoping the Teams comes up with the, the Zoom feature where you can see every face. So uh, I've been following that, and it looks like Microsoft is, is under a barrage of people asking for that. So uh, we're hopeful there too. It is important to see faces. Um, you know, some of the things that we do uh, just to, for team building in our office and to get folks together. Uh, we like to do project site visits. Uh, we go to completed projects and we walk through and the project leader and project team uh, will share with our whole team, including our marketing folks and anybody who wants to go and we'll walk the site and we, we kind of learn lessons together. So uh, why, why leave those lessons with just a few people when we can get those out to our whole team? So we've had to get creative with that and we've started to do what we're calling virtual, virtual tours. We had one given uh, the other day uh, with a project that was on a 3D Matterport camera site that we were able to go and take a look at and walk through. And we got a lot of great questions from the staff. And the other day, we just looked at a bunch of still photos for another project that, that was just completed. So I think it comes down to getting creative. It's, it's never going to be as good, but we're trying to get it to be a, a close second. Uh, the other thing we do is we, we're always celebrating our staff uh, birthdays. We do that in person with a little party at the end of the day. It gives everybody a chance to blow off steam and celebrate uh, one of our team members. And we've been sending cake off to folks uh, in their home offices and then raising a glass at the end of the day. So there, there are ways to do it uh, and try to keep everybody connected and spread those out through the day. Our, our, reps, our reps have been great about continuing with virtual lunch and learns and sending us Grubhub gift cards. So <laughs> Uh, yeah, everybody's everybody's jumping in and doing what they can to uh, make this the best it can be. Well, thank you. For yeah, that. I would I would I would echo that. Um, <clears throat> let's not forget about you know the sales folks who are trying to figure out how to how to make a go of it in this crazy world and and that juggling whether or not they should jump in with requesting this webinar and that webinar or trying to be selective and, and pull us into the things they think will be most meaningful based on our work. Um, but one thing I've noticed tech, with technology is this was maybe about a month, month and a half ago, we were having a webinar. It was just really hard to hear some of the folks on the other end. Um, I know one of the women working from home, she kept muting herself because the kid was crying in the background. Someone else, it was just a bad connection. And I found that was one of the ones where we don't see the faces. And so we're just the drawing up on the screen and we're just trying to get people's input in terms of what design direction we're supposed to take. And the mental energy that it took to just get my head around, you know, what the client wants and how we're supposed to go forward was, was much more challenging than if we had just been there in person. Um, but on the other side, you know, I was, I was saying to Stephen when we first were discussing this, that the idea about laying the drawing out on the table and everyone's got their pen or pencil and we're all talking about how the design is developing together. Those days are moving more electronic um, technology platforms anyway. And you know, we sit in meetings now and we watch the junior designer struggle to draw some lines on the drawing that you know, we could be putting up there pretty quickly, but we all sit and watch them do that and say, yeah, yeah, that's right. Or no, do it this way. So, um, I'm hoping to see, like I have seen the quick improvement in some of these web meetings where now everything is clear and as people are sort of showing their faces, things are, are communicated a little bit more easily. Uh, hope, hopefully it'll help that platform. 
uh, of design on the screen um, uh, progress as well. Uh, well, we're all kind of learning. It is a brave new world. I'll tell you, the, the, for me, uh, the way I've gotten to know my staff a lot better uh, than I knew them strictly kind of in professional situations. I think we're all a little bit closer now, uh, having a, a, a kind of a look into other people's, into their lives and into the things that are in their place. And just, you know, early morning project huddles to uh, Friday afternoon cocktail parties. We are spending more social time together, uh, perhaps less business time together, and more social time together. That's and that's been great. So, oh, there goes my phone. Uh, let me ask uh, one more question for y'all. Stephen, that uh, may be a job. That may be a proposal coming in. RFP, better answer that. <laughs> yeah. I'll send it to Jill. She seems to. She needs the help. Uh, so, uh, speaking of communication. Um, how uh, 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 do you foresee significant? Uh, have I got the right question up? I don't. I hit go, but it didn't go. Mm -hmm. ah. There we go. Did the fourth question come up on the screen? Yep. Yes. Okay, yeah, that's good. I'm not sure why it didn't before. Anyway, um, do you foresee significant changes in the way your studio is run or how you deal with staff and client communication? especially now that we've all been working remotely for many weeks. And we've kind of touched on this a little bit already. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, we have enough questions coming in from uh, people listening in that we'll, we'll get, this will be our last question So um, before we kind of turn it over to the crowd. So uh, Jim, can you lead off on this? Uh, sure. Yeah. We, I mean, we've been doing a lot of work from home, a lot of remote work, especially some individuals. Uh, but this has really tested us acutely in a way that we haven't been tested before. And I'm talking about sort of every team member. So uh, I'm, I'm sure all of us on our teams have folks that are especially good at, at sort of uh, heavy duty uh, production work, Revit, number crunching, uh, programs that, that typically run better on desktop machines. So we have some of our folks with, with all their gear at home. We, we gave them the ability to, to get that home and get set up with monitors and so forth. And a lot of other folks were all they had to do was take home their laptop and plug it into the monitors they already had. So technology is, I think, is, is one piece of this. Uh, but I think we're going to, because we're pushing this to a new limit, we're going to find out what we're capable of doing without being in the same place. So my sense is we're going to come back to a more flexible workplace. You know, the, the fear for folks like us who are running businesses is that when people are not in the office, that the work is not getting done. And I think we're proving to ourselves right now that we can do it. So the that's question a big is, lesson learned. yeah, it's a yeah. big lesson learned. So that's one of the things we're we're digging into. Uh, Jill, uh, following on Jim, I think that now that folks have um, a home office set up and we haven't necessarily dismantled everything in the office, most of the power um, of the machines that were there are still there, and so we've supplemented with some stuff at home, and it might give some people some more flexibility to decide where they want to be and some and sometimes I feel I'm such more I'm much more productive at the house without the distractions of folks at the office and sometimes the, the it, it's not a distraction at all at the office it's actually very productive to have those um, back and forth conversations and meetings and so I think I'm um, just giving folks a little bit more choice about where they feel uh, is most productive and most efficient to get their work done it's never been a concern that folks are um, if they're not in the office, that stuff's not getting done. People have a certain amount of, of stuff that needs to happen and they do a great job. My team is awesome and, and things do get completed and we do keep clients happy. Um, and this may just change a little bit of, of how that gets done. Um, I totally support that. And Keith, you have the last word on this question. Sure, sure. Thanks, Stephen. You know, there were certain things that were never included in our employee handbook. Now, page 28, <laughs> pandemic, right? Uh, we prepare for these kind of things. You know, I, I don't think um, I don't think much is is going to change. Quite frankly, it, it, most you know, getting more familiar with the technology. Obviously, most most of the folks in in our office that already work remotely will continue to do so. Maybe a little bit more efficient, efficiently, um, a little bit better familiarity with the technology, 
And once the kids go back to school, that's a big one. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, perhaps it will engage those folks who always come into the office or encourage them at least to, to work from home, maybe when they have a scratchy throat or the sniffles. <laughs> you know, again, making the, uh, the technology softer and more seamless uh, allows a better efficiency and workflow. I know, you know, for me too, I, I, I love to draw and I'm getting faster at Bluebeam. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. <laughs> Grateful for Bluebeam. Exactly. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you all for your insights. I wanted to just take uh, one little sidestep before we go on to the uh, question and answers. Um, I brought this graphic up last week on uh, the webinar I did with Don, and I thought it was worth bringing, up, bringing it up again because I know there's a lot of new people online. And for me, this, this graphic is all about asking the question, what sort of people are we? As individuals, as collectors of collectives of designers and administrators. Uh, where are we in terms of responding to this crisis? Uh, only you know and understand your unique situation. And uh, I look at this chart and I think about where I was on this chart a week ago. Uh, and I'm now beginning to think about where will I be on this chart a month from now. Um, managing stress and grief starts with the realization that we really can only control so much. Uh, as was as been evidenced by the three designers you've been hearing from, they're doing an amazing job of holding their companies together, holding their teams together, finding creative ways to communicate and solve deadlines and solve submittals, uh, and it's very impressive. Uh, so we're all working very hard to control that which is within our control. Um, economic fundamentals are still relatively intact. Uh, we're doing the work, it continues, the deadlines are looming, uh, but I still wonder about what thoughts of tomorrow will bring. So with that, uh, I am going to ask uh, Joe to jump in because he's been monitoring your questions and um, maybe we could yep. uh, see what you're all thinking out there. Some great questions coming in, so thank you. Um, first one, uh, I'll pose this question to Steve and Steve and pass it along to the next person, but we'll try to keep this brief because we have a lot of uh, questions. Great, um, great. How, uh, how do you manage to keep up motivation in your teams? Uh, well, the good news is uh, th that I have an incredibly motivated group of people <laughs> that I work with. Uh, and uh, from the designers to the administrators, uh, everybody, uh, is it has always been excited to do their job and works very hard at their job. Uh, and rather than answering the question, how do I keep them motivated? It's more of how do we make sure we keep them connected? I think Keith made a very good point. You know, when you're working on a project, there's a team of people, a couple of three people working on a project and they are very much in sync. You know, they are talking to each other all the time. They're talking to the client. They're in the outside world uh, virtually. Uh, but it's those happenstance conversations that you might have uh, with your project accountant or with somebody else that's working on other projects that you don't, that you don't talk to all the time, especially in other studios. Uh, that's what's missing. So that's the thing that I'm focused on is trying to figure out ways that we're all together and we can all talk about those things. Uh, Keith, do you want to? I'll, I'll let you kind of riff on that. Yeah, you know, that's exactly. It's a, that's exactly right. It is. Um... It is uh, tough to try to make sure that everybody is, you know, is happy and motivated and such. And, and you're right, we've got such a talented group of folks. Um, they motivate me, really. And um, to not be around them every day is, is kind of tough, right? Um, so the, what, the groups that you're working with is, is very important. But getting everybody in kind of the virtual room every week has been helpful a little bit to just make sure that nobody's kind of fallen off the fringes. Where's that little square, right? When we're looking at everybody on the screen, where, where's so-and-so? Oh, there they are. It, the, the squares keep moving around, right? But as long as everybody's in that in that little matrix, then then we feel pretty good about that. But, Great. Yeah. Jill or Jim, do you have something you want to add or should we move on? I'll just um, add I'll just... real quickly. Go ahead, Jill. Um, that having um, a remote or having a second office has trained us a little bit in this regard as to how do you keep connected and how do you keep motivated um, the person that you're not with. And so Maggie's doing a phenomenal job running the New York office. Still, there's going to be 
design questions and things that come up and, and doesn't she wish she had a whole group of people to bounce that off of and and she learned to do a great job but just pick up the phone and just make that call and I think that that's what we have learned to do within the Dallas office is you know we would just go upstairs or go across the the studio and and talk to somebody and now you just got to pick up the phone and do it and starting with just a little bit of you know hey personal stuff and then um and then moving on i think is great at keeping morale and and perhaps we've been fortunate or perhaps we've been nicely selective in getting the jobs that we want to do and i think you know i spoke with with robert yeah. earlier today he's like i love this job that i'm working on right now and so getting getting things that you're it's, it's why we do this right i mean we do this because we love yeah. this kind of project or this kind of work or what we can make of this space and so having that um, for folks to be able to work on and feel great about is, is super. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just throw in Jill, I think that's that's absolutely true. We, we need to remember kind of in the middle of all this, why we're doing what we're doing. Like you just said, we, we love design. We, lo we love to transform space with light. We need to, so for us, we, we do uh, our stu design studio meetings, which we've really been looking to do as much as we can sort of during this crisis. And essentially we get, uh, get a project that maybe that we're just starting up and the project team will share that with the whole group and we'll, we'll get our ideas out on the table. We feel like our best design ideas float to the top when we get everybody together. And maybe it's just a half an hour. Maybe it's just a certain portion of a given job. It may be the public areas or uh, the building facade, whatever it might be. Maybe the most difficult not to crack from a design standpoint. And I think that gives us a little break in our day so that people that are juggling five, 10 different projects have a chance to, to step out of that and just get into a session of a half an hour of just pure brainstorming and design. And I think that's refreshing to, uh, to our team members. And I was add one more thing. I think previously, if you'd see somebody was hard at work at something, you know, you tend not to bother them. Now you just pick up the phone and I'm like, okay, hey, Jacob, I'm gonna barge in on you here and just ask you this question. I don't know what you're doing, or, but. I mean, and so, you know, you shift, and I think that's in something I've always been able to do is make a quick shift, and I think I'm, I'm asking that of the folks that I work with now, but it's been great, so we just get it, you know, get, get the design uh, discussed and get it done. Take no prisoners. <laughs> uh, Joe, what's our, what's our next uh, question? Uh, first, it looks like you had an invite to go golfing at Foxwood, so uh, I'll, I might need to invite <laughs> someone there. Uh, <laughs> Don't forget me. <laughs> <laughs> but this question is for Jim. Uh, hi, Jim. I am like you and enjoy seeing people. The question I have is how are you managing installations to make sure what is designed is installed correctly? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I, we have a specific project I can point to right now. We have a, an office space for a well-known architecture firm that, um, and, and as we all know, when we design lighting for our own offices, we're our own most most difficult clients. So uh, we want to get this one right, needless uh, to say on this one. What we've done is we've had a couple of, of virtual site visits. So for now, uh, there are one or two people on site. And in this particular case, I believe it was a FaceTime meeting that we had with, uh, with the project leader from the architect's office and essentially walked us through the office. And we looked at the items that um, were on our punch list. And we were able to do that, do that remotely. So I, and, and I've seen a couple of other large architecture firms starting to roll out templates for virtual site visits. So there'll, there'll either be a video that's part of it or still shots that are coming that get embedded into the document. And there's a little bit of a disclaimer at the beginning that says, hey, we weren't able to get to the site. Uh, and this virtual site visit is, is what we're offering at this time. And it, it's like I said, it's not like being there in person, but it's it's the next best thing. So we're looking to get creative in ways to uh, to do our CA work. You know, one thing I heard about that is this is not my direct experience, was that the project architect was there and it was a FaceTime meeting, and then was told, okay, go and take a look at that and see how that is not pushed in all the way or installed correctly. And it, rather than it just showing up in a punch list report with a photograph. There was the architect right there seeing the problem and understanding the issue and and perhaps trying to fix it, seeing that she couldn't fix it 
And so right now, all of, all of a sudden, you have complete understanding on the part of that person, which might not have happened with the punch list report. That's true. Great. Okay. Yeah, hit us with another one. Next one. Um, this one's for everyone, but I'll direct this to first go to Keith. Uh, what are you doing to pre-plan bringing your employees back into your offices to accommodate for social distancing? Are you going to rearrange desks and offices? Are you going to be, do staggered shifts when you bring them uh, back in to reduce the number of people? And how do you handle team meetings? It's a great question. And um, we haven't really discussed when we bring people in. We've just discussed, well, hopefully, we'll be bringing people in soon. But our, our office is fairly fairly good size anyway, and there's a, there's a good amount of, of social distance between folks. I suspect that uh, there will still be uh, a handful of us, so half of us perhaps, working from home uh, when, when the office does open. Those that can, those that usually do. And hopefully with that, we're also going to be out you know, in some more meetings and such as well, or at least out in job sites. So the density in the office is never that great anyway. I just suspect that it will be a little bit less as we kind of filter back into this into this uh, new reality anybody else for, for our office in dallas you know we're that texas is huge we're pretty spread out the, the concern is you know maggie in new york sharing an office we rent a space in an architect's office and that's a new york city space and it's crowded and there's not a lot of space and so that's something we're certainly going to have to think about you know how quickly that comes back into play and that, that may be much more delayed. We'll have to see. But to, but to Keith's point, I think uh, I'm guilty of saying, okay, yes, I'm planning for it to happen, but how it happens? No, I haven't given really much thought to that yet. <laughs> and I should. Yeah, it, you know, and it's interesting to see, you know, how our, you know, how our political leaders are gonna deal with the situation. And um, I was reading in the paper today that uh, when when we do all start kind of trickling back to work, it, it may be that some of the older folks uh, uh, in the company, that would be me, uh, well, may not be uh, invited back as quickly as some of the younger folks. So it might be a kind of a rolling thing. So it, it may give may give us some time in the office to improvise a little bit, kind of figure these things out in real time, in real space, which is, is probably a pretty helpful thing. Yeah. I agree. I, I'll throw one more thing in just from an international standpoint. I've been speaking to some clients who who have offices in, in Asia, and they're talking about sort of learning from their colleagues there, which I think is very important. I mean, this yeah. this pandemic is is moving at different speeds and in different places in the world. Uh, we have an office in, in Melbourne, Australia, and when we spoke with our staff there, they were quite surprised that we were that we were sending people to work at home because it just hadn't hit them quite as hard there yet. But about two weeks later or three weeks later, they completely understood why we were doing that. So I think learning from what's happening uh, in, in China, in Hong Kong, uh, we have a friend we just talked to who, who sent us a care package of all the things that she needed <laughs> during, the, during the pandemic that she no longer needs as much of. So learning from folks who have already been through this and are at a different place is gonna be important to how we strategize about getting back to work. That is great advice. That's great. All right. Next question. Um, I'll let you uh, figure out who's going to answer this one first, Stephen. Uh, oh, I'm thanks. happy to hear that the panelists uh, on this call are more fortunate than others in the industry. Here in California, we're seeing large architectural firms experiencing layoffs, and it's only a matter of time that it affects us. In general, project starts are delayed, construction is slowed, and credit is limited uh, for developers. Uh, economic forecasts. Uh, have been catastrophic. Is the panel preparing for this as well? Oh, uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with Jim uh, and see see what he where he leads what road he leads us down. Here. It's a, yeah, sure. It's a I, I mean, question. yeah, it's a huge question. Uh, I think the key to this is the answer is yes. Uh, we we don't know what's coming. I think we we've, we've discussed that. We don't know how deep it's going to go. So I think as we look at our business, we're looking at, at what we're calling a business continuity plan. And that plan has, has multiple levels to it. And we continue, we continue to meet um, weekly, sometimes daily, 
to talk about adjustments that we're going to have to make. So I think as we start to see how things roll out, um, you know, we're monitoring the number of projects that are going on hold. We've had a couple of large projects go on hold. We've had um, probably between 10 and 20 are affected in some way at this point. Uh, but like everybody else says, we're getting a lot of RFPs. So I, I, don't, I don't think we want to be, we want to continue to think positively. We, we want to continue to lead in a positive way. Uh, but we need to prepare for we need to prepare for the worst, quite frankly. Uh, so putting into putting into place economic measures that that uh, take away unnecessary spending, um, looking at, at all the possible programs and possibilities that are available from the government or local government or federal government, we're doing that, uh, and then getting ready to be nimble enough to um, look at other measures if we need to down the road. But uh, we're taking it one step at a time. I, I, I will say that this, this notion of planning has been unbelievably complicated when you think about how quickly, you know, from the time we really began to realize what sort of a threat this was to the, to the point where we were out in our homes working remotely, it, it felt like the, the flip of a light switch, if you will. Um, it was very quick. Yeah. Uh, kind of shockingly quick. And I, I, I guess back in the, in the depression, uh, when, when everything crumbled overnight, uh, perhaps that was the same way. But in, in, in all of the economic downturns that uh, I've experienced as a business person, uh, it's, it's felt like we've had a little bit more time to plan uh, and that it's always felt like tomorrow's going to be a better day. Uh, and here, uh, this sense, uh, this again, this underlying sense of anxiety is with us uh, Constantly, no matter no matter what joke we're laughing at, there's still that kind of underlying uneasiness, and so uh, it is it is something that's all of our senior staff in all of our firms, I think, need to think about and discuss. Um, we've certainly had conversations about worst case scenarios, but then we, you know, thank goodness the work is continuing to come in, and we've been able to kind of shelve those and hopefully keep those in a drawer and never have to pull them out. <laughs> Well, you're right. You know that the scenarios are, are correct, Stephen. And and to uh, Jim's point, uh, you know that the business continuity plan, right? There was just a big thing in the AIA that they wrote up about. You know, how do you keep these businesses going? And um, since it is such a you know a light switch approach, it went so fast. Mm -hmm. You know, we meet on we meet weekly uh, and talk about the business and run all those different scenarios. Yeah. From the blissful optimism to yeah to doomsday right and everything in between, and we look at what's coming in and we look at our workflow and we look at you know all of that stuff, and we try to extrapolate as much as possible. But we've got something in store for every part of the every part of the you know every every scenario in a way. We hope we don't have to use the doomsday scenario obviously, yeah. but something sure. it will be something in between there right yeah. between blissful optimism that nothing changes and you know, the end. <laughs> you know, this whole PPP program has shown great promise, but like anything else that was invented overnight for millions of businesses, uh, it's it's hard to see. Uh, first of all, are we going to be able to take care of everybody that needs that help? Uh, I, I think, think it's, it's out of money already. <laughs> yeah, it's, and so hopefully there'll be there'll be more money that comes in. It seems like a, to me, it seems like an intelligent way to uh, continue to support the infrastructure of a business as well as the people in the business, and that's why I, that's why I think it's a good idea. It's not just yeah. going all exactly. the way to the unemployed person. And so the the challenge in this is that in order to not have to repay the money, keeping our employment levels at a consistent or better level is, I think, a, is a pretty clever a pretty clever right. challenge to the. To that's the, what we hopefully do best, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, next question is for everyone, but I'll direct it to Jill first, and then Jill can pass along to whoever she'd like. Uh, since we're all lighting designers uh, the, uh, that can work from home, uh, can be carried out easily since most of the work is done on software and laptops and computers. But what about the uh, people in the lighting industry who do not work on any software, but surely uh, solely depend on walk-in customers in a lighting showroom? Or a factory. <laughs> or a factory. So the, the question is, what what are those people to do um, yeah. because they don't have the uh, at home infrastructure? Well, I mean, we've certainly seen this when we speak with the factories that we work with, and how are they accommodating for 
um, keeping product flowing, but keeping all their staff safe. And you know, we've heard of some measures of uh, making sure that there's disinfectant UV as people walk in, taking their temperatures before they walk in, um, separating them, having physical barriers. I, I mean, even just going to the grocery store, you see those quick changes where there's physical barriers now. And, um, you know, that that's going to be the short term um, solution to keeping things running. But kind of building on the last question that there is a potential for doomsday, but we do see that in generally the economy is still pretty strong. We didn't have a lot of economic factors that have brought this on. So we assume that once the um, the pandemic, the health concern subsides somewhat, that we'll we'll come back and and um, but we do have at least you know in our area in Texas some underlying economic concerns with the oil industry and the low price mm -hmm. of oil right now, um, depressing things and depressing funds for development for sure. And that was something that was coming before this pandemic started. So we had been thinking about um, how that might affect business. But um, I, I think if it is possible for the wheels to keep turning, even if they're a little bit slower, and for factories to keep working, people who are in the sales business um, to keep working, then um, we'll continue along. I didn't quite answer the showroom question, which I guess the other retail one is a really tough one right now. People aren't going into retail stores to see things, but I know there's a lot of online stuff. It still makes it hard for lighting showrooms to keep going. I don't have an answer for that. I mean, there's been some pretty creative ways of introducing products and such to, you know, the specifiers, that kind of thing, and webinars, of course, and, you know, <clears throat> beach blanket bingo on Fridays or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, just just these little things at least keep us in the loop, right? We're still, as, as Jim, I think, said, we still have some lunch and learns uh, coming mm -hmm. up and, you know, seeing it that way. So the creativity of how to use that, when you can't be physically to, together, it's it's a tough one. And and just to jump in before Jim, some of these lunch and learns, these on web things have been incredibly efficient. They say, okay, we're gonna do this in 20 minutes and they show a bunch of product. You can't hold them and kick the tires the way we really want to. But the amount of information that comes in 20 minutes is great. And they keep to 20 minutes when they've got a full audience of 100 plus people, as opposed to when they came in the office and they had four or five of us and 20 minutes turned into 45. So it's maybe a good use of time. Good point. <laughs> oh, that never happens in our office. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's that's part of what I miss, Jill, is those extra 25 minutes of kibbutzing, right? <laughs> Be beating up the rep. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Tearing fixtures apart, right? That <laughs> I miss. I do. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to do some speed rounds here because we got a, a whole bunch of questions to get through. I want to make sure we get them all in in a timely manner. So very quickly, each of you, uh, I'd be interested to hear what developers, architects are saying about future projects or plans in each of the speakers' markets. So really quickly, each one of you. Stephen, go first. Uh, well, I'm finding that there's a lot of secrecy about that, honestly. Uh, there's not a lot of people talking about this. I think there's people in boardrooms trying to make these decisions. So. The phone's still ringing. There are still some RFPs coming in in all sectors of our architecture and museum business. Um, it's a hard question to answer because there's a lot of secrecy surrounding it. Yeah, I agree with I agree with Stephen. It's it's they're they're, they're holding the, the cards close to their chest. It's right. things are fine. We're we're moving on. Talk to you next month. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody knows. Uh, I I've, I've noticed when I talk to clients. Uh, some have some have better outlook than others. Uh, I think depending on the type of work they're doing, uh, it seems like some industries are are thriving in, in this pandemic. And and uh, if you have a if you happen to have a project with a large online retailer, that project may be surging forward because a lot of these folks are hiring a lot of new a lot of new workers. So I think some of this is going to going to depend upon the the sector. And I think we're going to be seeing, like we, like I have in every recession that I've been through, which has been uh, two or three now, uh, work is going to change. Maybe there's more, more, more work that we'll do that's renovation work, or perhaps we may shift from one of our service offerings to the other. I know we we do theater planning as well, so there are a whole host of items that come into play when, when you think about yeah. folks getting back to entertainment venues, right? So we have a we have a lot of thinking to do about that, and. Uh, I'm sure we're, we're all going to come out of it with uh, learning learning a lot of lessons, and there's going to be a lot of creativity spent, um, you know, getting folks 
folks back into these into these venues. But I, I would just say it's going to depend on sector. It's going to depend on client. I think some clients who do a lot of hospitality, restaurants, things like that, unless their projects are really far out there, we have a few large mm -hmm. casino projects that are surging forward because they won't be built for a year or two. But ones that are in CA or just about to go into CA, uh, some of those are, are stopping. So th there's a whole host of answers from, from our standpoint. Great. Uh, Jill, how do you feel about future product presentations with lighting reps and manufacturers coming to your into your office after all of this? Mm -hmm. Well, as I was saying before, there are some definite um, pros to seeing some of the stuff online. And I think where we thought we were headed before we all went home was we were not letting any folks in the office, only people who worked there could come in there and anyone who wanted to show product, you could drop it off and we were, you know, wiping some things down. And I think we might return that way where we want to see it. We want to kick the tires. We can do an online thing to talk about the features and the benefits, but the kicking the tires part probably is not going to be in person for a little while, although we do want the actual piece of equipment we may let it just sit there for three days you know if anything on it might die but um uh, that's potentially one way i think there's going to be a whole new perception out there of how people act when they go back out in the real world that's very true. Avenue. uh steven how can local lighting agencies and lighting manufacturers help uh to support you and your staff and business during this time well, they're all, uh, you know, they're all trying to invent a whole new paradigm. Matter of fact, I, I made a, I made a comment about beating up on our reps, and one of my reps has already texted me. He's listening in, so uh, <laughs> they're everywhere. Uh, uh, I think our reps actually know how important they are to us, and uh, I'm, I, I, I think that um, the way we deal with reps uh, and the way we uh, interact with them, uh, frankly. Uh, you know, I think human beings have a pretty short memory, uh, and I think that we will all sort of slowly uh, do a dance with not just our reps, but you know, everyone we we interact with, from it, from from staff members interacting to everyone else who comes through the door, including the UPS uh, person. Um, but I, I I honestly think that you know, a year from now, um, I'm hopeful that this will be something where we're kind of back to normal because people need the interaction with people. Uh, people need to build. I mean, I think we're all, we kind of all do what we do because we just have this uh, innate desire to build and create something new. Uh, and I I don't see the world now looking back, you know, a couple of years from now, looking back to uh, April 2020, uh, I, I don't see the world being fundamentally different because I just don't think people are built that way. But Time will tell. Thank you. Uh, we're almost at our time, but I want to finish these last three last three questions. So I'm going to pose each one to the rest uh, to one specific person. So Keith, you're up first. You talked about projects being put on hold. What about payments and cash flow issues? Are your customers already experiencing that? Any repercussion on your business? We have been very diligent lately. Uh, we're we're hammering we're knocking on every door right now and you know we'd go we go face to face to collect the, the checks now so far so good but we'll see how how long it takes I call on Keith's clients just to get the checks for him <laughs> gets a, he gets a finder's fee actually <laughs> one thing to throw in on that if I may I I think that some of these electronic transfers are are looking a little bit um, more acceptable to some of our clients so. I think that's going to be one yeah. silver lining to this. I think there's going to be more money moving electronically, uh, which hopefully will get us all paid faster. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Jill, you uh, well, everyone, but I want Jill to answer this one. Um, you have big, uh, big, you have big studios with branches in different cities and countries. But what would you recommend to small studios with just a few projects running? No one is hiring. Projects are frozen. So are payments. Um, I think if, if you, to continue to do what you were doing and we're, we're doing a good job keeping those clients happy, then, um, continuing, um, to ask those folks and, and get references. It's how we built our business 15 years ago. And I think it's, it sounds like it's continuing to build a business. I, I don't, I don't think things are going to stay frozen for very long, so some of that stuff will come back, but if there's not anything in the pipeline or happening right now, 
then the marketing aspect of the business just needs to kick in a little bit more than it than it did. Perhaps others have a better Jim, you have a better piece of advice? I, I mean I don't. It's 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 it all gets back to relationships with people. So Everybody's going through this together. And what we've been doing, it's no different for a small firm or, or a large firm. We've been, we've been getting in touch with our clients and doing our best to, to let them know we're available. Uh, I think all of us are gonna be getting, getting less work. But um, yeah, I think, I think some, of, some of this sort of sharpening the saw can go on uh, in terms of perhaps um, you know, getting ready when things do ramp up again. Maybe there are things that, that uh, you never have a chance to do because you're too busy doing the work, but uh, maybe there's a little time now to do some of those things. So we, you're right, we, yeah, we, website development. Yeah. yeah, yeah, some of those things may you may have some time to do. Now, certainly the funds will, will be tough for that, but um, we're, we're doing some of that in our office. If, if our project work drops off, uh, we have what we call innovation tasks. These are things that we all want to get done for our office so that when we get back up and we're running at full steam, we're working more efficiently when we get back. So uh, I don't have a silver bullet for that, but th those are just a few thoughts. Um, does anyone in the panel, uh, have any of you committed to summer interns? Yes, one, okay. Um, are you following through on that commitment? So far, uh, yeah. Well, we have, we, have uh, we are supposed to have a summer intern in our Raleigh office, and we're still waiting to see whether that Pick a particular person who actually got a grant to do this uh, is going to be joining us or not. Other than that, we've kind of made a decision to um, to, to keep the staffing levels where they are at the moment. I mean, we've got we have this, a, this is local, so it's someone who we can put their start time off. Somebody lives local, both in our right. Pittsburgh yeah. office in Boston. So if they have to start a month later or so, they they've already been contacted about that. We've yeah, actually got a larger go commitment with um, one of our former employees who left to go get her master's who's now coming back on for the summer. So she'll be coming back on as a full-on lighting designer. And um, you know, we'll, we've said that, yep, we're, we're taking her. And so we will, we'll keep that commitment. Yeah, on Would our you? side, we, yeah, we have uh, two, two interns that, that we committed to early on. Uh, and essentially what we've asked them to do is to work work remotely until such time that they can come to Chicago. We don't know, they're not from Chicago, so we don't necessarily want them to come here until we're all back in the office because there's not really any benefit to doing that. So one of our interns has worked with us for, for a long time and she's already set up remotely. The other one will have to get set up from where she is. Uh, and then we're, we're hoping that we can get them in for at least a part of the summer to be with us in person, but we'll have to wait and see. Okay. Uh, before we before we go, I just wanted yeah. to tell everybody that um, this little article that I referenced at the beginning of the at the beginning of our webinar, where uh, I was able to gather the thoughts and the insights from nine designers from around the world, uh, will be available from the IALD uh, early next week, Monday or Tuesday. You'll be getting an email uh, with a link to that article, and you'll be able to download that. With that. That concludes our webinar. Um, there are some more questions, but uh, I'm going to follow up uh, with the speakers afterwards and send those to you guys and um, have you answer them there. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, I don't want to go over too long. Uh, special thank you to Stephen uh, for putting the article together and um, coming up with the, of this idea of doing a virtual version of the article. So thank you very much, Stephen. Panelists, thank you very much for joining me on a snowy Chicago day. And That's to right. the attendees, <laughs> 200 plus of you from around the world joining wow. us. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time, whatever time zone you're in. If it's the middle of the night or super early in the morning, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, if you miss any part of this, uh, this will be uploaded to the IALD YouTube page. Uh, so look for it there. And uh, with that, thank you again, everyone. Have a great rest of your day or evening. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists, thank you, Joe. Thanks to the ILD and thanks for for tuning in and, and hearing hearing us talk. It, it means a lot to all of us to know that we're all in this together. Right. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.